This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. A conversation with history. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Jeff Hawkins, who is the Hitchcock uh, professor on the Berkeley campus in uh, the spring of 2012. Jeff Hawkins is an inventor, engineer, neuroscientist, author, and entrepreneur. He founded both Palm Computing and Handspring, created the Redwood Neuroscience Institute to promote research on the brain and cognition, and is a member of the scientific board of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. He authored on intelligence, which was written with Sandra Blakesley, and his latest company is Numenta, which brings his two passions together, uh, study of the brain and the development of intelligent machines. Uh, Jeff, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Where were you born and raised? I was born on Long Island in New York. And looking back, how do you uh, think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? I had a pretty unusual childhood. Um, my father was uh, sort of the uh, consummate inventor, not particularly successful, but we, uh, I grew up in a, in, a, in a house where we were just building crazy things all the time, crazy boats and so on, and uh, uh, exposed to a lot, of, um, a lot of different things as a child. And, and uh, as in reading up on you, your, he, your, your father and the family together made floating boats, is that? Well, he did lots of things, my father did, uh, but one of the things he did, um, he built a lot, of, a lot of unusual craft, floating craft, and one was, the, at the time, the largest um, uh, air cushion craft. It wasn't a hovercraft, but it was a round boat. We eventually, it was for research, eventually it was sold to an orchestra, and I toured with an orchestra around New York City on this unusual thing, it looked like a spacecraft. Um, and that's one of many projects, but it was very influential as a child. And, and this must have, been, have made a, uh, an important uh, both impression, but also a way of learning a lot of skills that became useful later. It did. Uh, there's no question about it uh, that I had exposure to a lot of tools, a lot of different environments. Uh, we weren't a wealthy family at all. Uh, we we're, were kind of living on the edge of lower middle class, I would say. But I had a, a wealth of different experiences. At the time, I didn't really understand what, the value of that. But later in life, uh, it became clear that it really did help me in many ways. And, and it's not just the, the, the practical element of working with tools, but it, 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 to the extent that you seem to be saying that your father would envision things that weren't there before. Yeah, I've, I'll tell you a story. When I was in third grade, there was a thing called a weekly reader. I don't know if it still oh, exists. Oh, yeah, of course. And we got this. In third grade, my father was on the cover of Weekly Reader. And he, he, was, uh, he had an invention at the time called the Septron, which was a, a type of a pattern recognition. There he was with a microphone talking to a dolphin. And, uh, you know, this is very unusual for a third grader to have this kind of thing happen. And, and you know, so, my, you know, I was always exposed to these kind of unusual things. And so what was the, the discussion at the dinner table like? Was it about, well, how do we fix this boat or how do we uh, design this project? Uh, it was uh, a, big, a mixed thing. Um, uh, we, we are definitely, it was definitely a lot of, like, let's go back out to the garage and work on something. Uh, right after dinner, um, and in our house, our house uh, actually the garage was the warmest part of the house. So in the winter, that was where we went. Um, but it was, you know, we also uh, I wouldn't say it was a very philosophical upbringing. Uh, I was brought up in a secular atheist home, and and uh, and we did discuss, you know, the world matters a bit. My father subscribed to Scientific American from from a child, and so those were always in the house, and I read them religiously every month. Uh, I still do that. And um, so it was, there was a culture of, hey, the world is interesting, let's explore it. Mm -hmm. 
And and uh, where did you do your your? It, well, let's say, talk about it in when you were in high school. Did you do a lot of science in high school? And then where did you do your undergraduate? Um, work? In high school, I was um, I, I I never really worked particularly hard. I always did well. Um, and so to me, high school is more of a matter of like, hey, let's find something fun to do while I have to take these classes. <laughs> so I did computer projects. I was often given leeway to do, very, actually sometimes excuse myself from things in physics and so on. I could just do what I wanted to. Um, so I kind of cruised through mm -hmm. that. And then I went to, uh, I went to Cornell University. Uh, it really wasn't much of a choice. I just said, I'm living in New York. I, that's a place I can get scholarships. And it's a good university. And so I'm, that's where I'm going to go. And what did you major in? Uh, uh, electrical engineering, mm -hmm. um, which was, I didn't have a passion for that, but I remember, uh, again, this is a, something from my father, influential. I was thinking about getting into alternative energy. This is in the, you know, the early, um, mid-70s. And he said, you know, this computer stuff looks pretty interesting. These microelectronics, why don't you think about that? And I said, okay. <laughs> Very good. And then from, from there, but what, was it there that you got what we might call the neuroscience bug? No, did, no, no, it wasn't. Uh, it was uh, right after I graduated, and I graduated in the spring of 1979. In the fall of 1979, there was a single topic issue of Scientific American, every September issue, mm -hmm. and it was about the brain. Uh, this was one of the best issues they've ever had. Lots of other neuroscientists will say the same. And I, reading that issue was really what ignited my um, interest in brains. And, and what, what, Anything in particular that struck you? You seem to be saying that the, the Crick essay was really important. Yes, it was. So I read, you know, like a lot of people, I read, we're all interested in the brain, right? What, who shouldn't, who wouldn't be interested in the brain? It's who we are. And so with all these details, and you can read about the neurons and this and this. And then the last essay was by Francis Crick of DNA fame. And uh, he wrote an essay of something called, like, Thinking About Thinking, I think it was called. And he said, this is all well and good. We have all this data, lots of data, data, data. He says, but we have no theory here. And we're lacking sort of, a, you know, th there's been no assimilation to this data into a theoretical framework. And it struck me like, like a bolt of lightning. I said, wow, what a great problem. We have the data. We don't have the theory. It's not like we're, we're starting from scratch. I said, this is something we can do in my lifetime. And I decided right then and there that I was going to dedicate my life to that. And then uh, as you are looking to do advanced graduate work, you had interesting experiences both with MIT and with Berkeley. Talk a little about that because it, it seems to be important. Yeah, well, so I said, okay, I was, I was working in industry as a, as a computer engineer, and I said, well, I really want to do brain, so I need to go back to school. I need a, 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 a research curriculum in my life. So I first applied to MIT, which had the AI lab. I said, well, they want to build intelligent machines. They must be interested in how intelligent works. I said, so I applied there, and they said, yeah, we want to build intelligent machines, but brains don't matter. And uh, I literally, one of the faculty said to me, brains are just messy computers, so why bother studying them? We don't, we're not interested in brains here. You can't do that here. And I thought that was wrong. But as a young person, I was devastated, being rejected. Um, but I said, OK, pick myself up, and I'll try again. And a few years later, um, I, I got myself into uh, a biophysics program at Berkeley. This was the closest I could get to theoretical neuroscience. There wasn't any theoretical neuroscience back then. Um, and I had this, you know, study a lot of biology. I didn't have that in my background, so I did a lot of prep for this. I got in here, um, and uh, and so I was a graduate student at Berkeley starting in 1986, very beginning in 1986. Uh, but I quickly found out about five months into it that I wouldn't be able to do what I wanted to do here either. And and uh, you reached some conclusions uh, about the academy from that. Is that fair? A fair statement? Um, you mean the Academy of Berkeley, or, or just the Academy generally? In other words, here you are, a young guy who say, says, "Hey, I want to do this," from an entirely different approach, and two of the top places in the country said, "Well, we can't do that here." Yeah. It, what was interesting about Berkeley was uh, it was a bit more sympathetic. The reaction I got from faculty was, "This is great. We need to be doing this." Um, it's great that you went, and you have good ideas, but you can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I realized at that time, and the reason why I couldn't do it, because there was no faculty doing very close to what I wanted to do, and, and I didn't really understand that when I came to Berkeley. And so um, it struck me as, oh, wow, there's a whole different aspect of the problem. I realized it wasn't just up against a scientific problem, but I had an institutional problem. Mm -hmm. It's like if, if people agree that this is a good thing to do, and they tell you you can't do it, that's an institutional problem. And I said, I have to address that issue as well. 
And, and somewhere in, uh, maybe it was in the book on intelligence, you, you suggest that one of the things about the academic environment was it, it's reluctant to take risk. Is, uh, that, is that a fair Well, I, that was something I was told over and over again. I, I might have concluded that on my own, but it's not, it's not something I felt. Um, it, other people told me that, mm -hmm. and they'd explain why. Um, it was interesting. Uh, later in life, when I started the Redwood Neuroscience Institute, uh, I had a chance to go visit NIH and NSF and DARPA. Uh, and I had a, a good inside person on my board, and so we got to meet with all the top program directors in neuroscience at NIH and the top program directors at NSF. And I told them about my interest in you know, why I'm starting an institute. And I said, I'm not raising money. I want to talk to you about working about how we're going to develop models of the neocortex. And they were like, this is great. This is wonderful. We need this. We need this. We need this. And, they, and then the NIH dir uh, program director started saying, unfortunately, we can't do any of this. And here's why we are unable to fund this kind of research. Not just me. I wasn't asking for funding. They're saying why they can't fund other people who want to do this. Mm -hmm. And it's like very, very interesting to learn about why it was so difficult for neuroscientists to incorporate a theoretical paradigm into their work. And there's all these different um, uh, uh, forces which were making it difficult for people to do this. And what in particular? Well, it, uh, it, I think there's several things. Um, one is, at this time, it's just, it's, things have changed now a bit. But back then, um, uh, there, was, there wasn't a long history of theory in, in neuroscience. Uh, there wasn't a long history of theory in biology in general, but in general, you know, it, that changed. But in neuroscience, it was later to change. And so, you know, it was originally a classification science. And so, um, and then, and so a lot of the old guard, if you will, looked down upon theoretical things like, you know, this is about, you know, animal studies, wet labs, you know, there's no room for theory here. Then the way funding came about, this is what I heard from the NIH directors, is that um, uh, the way they're funding is, is a very, it's a consensus peer review process. And since money is tight, nobody wants to, to take a risk on anything which is slightly speculative. Um, I'm not blaming, there's nothing, you know, I can totally understand this. I'm not, there's no uh, anger about this at all. It's just that this is the way the world was. Um, so it was interesting to, to learn all these forces that were at play there. And, and at this point in your career, you, you decide to go uh, into the world of uh, computers, Silicon Valley, and, and uh, to become an entrepreneur, inventor, and thinker there. And, and your goal here was to, what, provide? I, I, so let me tell you, so I was a graduate student at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I, would, I had been here for a while, and I basically I was told, you can't do what you want to do. And I had a choice. I could do something else as a graduate student related in neuroscience, but I didn't, I, I looked at that and I said, that's not going to work for me. I'm going to get stuck doing this other thing and I won't be able to actually end up doing the thing I wanted to do. So I was very bummed out about this and so I had to sort of reset my life. I said, what am I going to do? I have to do something. Uh, so I said, okay, I'm going to go back and work. I'd already been working in computers for a number of years before I became a graduate student at Berkeley. So I'd given up my career to become a graduate student. And I said, I'm going to go back into the computer field. I thought I would do it for four years, and I had, I had several goals. One goal, as I said, look, I'm up against an institutional problem, so I need to learn about institutions. I need to, how do I affect broader issues? So I said, well, you know, building a business and running a company is a good way of sort of learning how to be a more influential person in the world. Um, the second thing I said, well, neuroscience is going to progress, and maybe people will become more amenable to the approaches that I wanted to do. Uh, another thing I did, I said, well, maybe if I can make a little bit of a name for myself, it'll open some doors. And finally, I said, if I can put some money in the bank, then I can afford to be a student again because I'm starting to raise a family and I can't really, you know, be, um, I, I have to live a life. So I said, okay, I'll try to do that in four years. Um, and I, I'm very lucky. Um, I was uh, lucky in my work and I was able to be successful in many ways. Uh, it turned out that once I got, and I love mobile computing, and I thought, this is a great thing to work on. And, 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 and so I got into it, it was very difficult to extract myself from it. I'll tell you a little story. When I started Palm, and I had to, I had to raise money from venture capitalists, um, I actually put it in the founding documents of Palm that I, my real interest was neuroscience, <laughs> and that I, my goal in, in, in a few years was to go back and work on neuroscience, because we had to state, they, wanted, they were worried that I was going to abandon this right away. And, um, so I said, okay, I'm going to put in a number of years here, and then, but everyone knows after those years I can start spending some time on neuroscience again. Well, it turned out that the success of Palm and, and, and those, those ventures really kind of built, and, and I got swept away, and it was very difficult to extract myself from it. It took me quite a few years to really get myself completely out of it again. When, when you look at your career, the, you, you had a, 
uh, an important insight. Uh, and, and as I understand it, that insight was, on the one hand, I want to study and make and build intelligent machines. But to do that, I have to, the model to look at is how the brain works. I, is that a fair statement of, of, of the two uh, uh, ideas that have motivated you? It's a fair statement of two ideas, but they came in a different order. My first love was, and is, the brain. I want to understand how my brain works. I want to understand how your brain works. Um, you know, humanity, we are brains. Everything we do, our conversation, our science, our literature, our history, our art, it's a product of brains. And our knowledge of the world, our ability to ask questions of the world is what brains do. So to, to, if I want to understand our place in the universe, I have to understand what brains are. And so this to me was a pure love of, inf love of knowledge. I then quickly said, well, if we figure out how brains work, we can build machines that work on those principles, and that's the way to build uh, truly intelligent machines. That wasn't my number one motivation, and it still isn't. But I realize that is a very, and now I've come to understand that's a very important thing to do as well. So I, it, the order is a little different, but the two go hand to hand. You can't really do one without the other. And, and do, setting out on this course in that order that you just described meant you wound up uh, wearing a lot of hats and I'm curious because students watch this interview so I'm curious in, in as to what the skills required on the one hand to be a theorist then an engineer an inventor and an entrepreneur and, and the other hand uh, uh, the temperament that's involved now what I want to ask you is is there overlap and that there these these different uh, roles are not as different as we think? Um, the roles are pretty different, uh, but uh, there is a common theme. And the common theme is I had very clear long-term goals. Mm -hmm. And an, I was persistent. Mm -hmm. And if, if to get to my long-term goals I had to start a company, I'm going to start a company. It's not easy. It is a lot of work. Uh, it is filled with anxiety and problems and bad days. Um, to see my goals, I had to start a, a, a neuroscience institute. How do, we, how do you start a new institute? Um, who's going to be the first one to show up? You put a sign on the street and say, come to my institute. Um, so these are difficult problems. But, um, and, and, but in the end, it was, I, had, I had clear goals in my life, and it's just a matter of persistence. If I had to learn something totally new, I had to learn how to make cell phones. I didn't know how to make cell phones. Um, I built one of the first smartphones. So I had to learn how to do that. I had to learn how to start companies. I had to learn how to run an institute. Um, I had to learn how to, um, um, you know, interact with academic environments and, and give talks and so on. So it, but it's all towards a goal. I, I won't say it was all easy. Uh, it was actually quite difficult. Um, but you have that long-term goal and you say, okay, life's challenging. These are difficult obstacles, but I think I can overcome them. Let's keep going. Just don't give up. So, so what, what you're describing, in addition, is it takes courage to do this. Is that, is that I, I, will, I won't use that word. If you want to use that yeah, word, that's yeah. fine. I, I think persistence is the right thing. It's, it's the never give up. Um, it is the ability to, you know, I, I, I remember once I gave a, um, a talk at UC Davis. And I rode in the car with a friend of mine who is a, um, a scientist who studies earthquakes. And... Um, and here I was, a, a computer entrepreneur, and I was going to give a talk to our neuroscience department about brains. And he was like, he was astounded. He said, you feel comfortable doing that? And he says, you know, are they going to respect you? Uh, you know, what are your credentials for doing this? And he thought this is like, this is like so gutsy or so crazy. And I'm like, well, what else am I going to do, right? You know, I, you know, so, so there is this sort of attitude like, you know, and it's a little awkward at first. You know, you get up there and who's this guy and why is he talking to us? And how, maybe I don't speak the same language they do. Uh, that's often the case, especially in a complex field like neuroscience. There's lots of different languages and different approaches people take. But, you know, you just plow forward and you just have to go with the punches. And, and what, what in your formative experiences made you this way? Uh, I remember my parents trying to tell me about Santa Claus as a kid. And I immediately said, that's not possible. I just don't I believe that. And, uh, <laughs> and I had a problem as a child, which my mother took me to a doctor to see if there, was, that, if there was something wrong with me. The problem was that I would hear what I expected to hear and not what people actually saying. I'd literally, you'd say a sentence to me, and I would 
hear it as what I thought you were going to say. And it was so problematic mm. at times. My mother said, maybe there's something wrong if you're hearing. And, and I internalized. I said, you know what? I just have a model of the world. I, ha I have this expectation of what's going to happen. And, I'm, and, and that's so strong, it drives me. So it's, it was a very internally focused view of the world. And I think that's, that's stuck with me for my whole life. Uh, you are a theorist uh, in a field that didn't have a theory. And uh, so in understanding you, one actually gets some important insights about theorizing. And, and going back to the Crick article, in, in other words, what the, the theorist problem is that there's a lot of data coming in from different streams of information. And, and in the end, there is no big uh, explanatory understanding. Uh, talk about theorizing, because this is yeah. very difficult than being an engineer. So, you know, when I realized I had this institutional problem, uh, like being a theorist in a theory, theory field that doesn't have theory, I went back and studied the history of scientific ideas. Uh, I read back and read Thomas Kuhn's and History of Scientific Revolutions. I talked, you know, I tried to figure out what happens here, how do you go about this? And that was actually very useful for me, uh, because uh, Kuhn talks about what you do differently in science when you're working in a field that doesn't have a paradigm. And, and you have to sort of be a little bit different. He talks about how you, where you publish and the way you interact and, and how science is conducted. So I took that as sort of, oh, great, I can be a little different here. Um, I might have to take different approaches. Um, I might have to publish this as a, as a popular book as opposed to scientific papers and so on. Um, and so I, I took that process and I really sort of thought about the process of what you'd have to do about this. Um, and, um, and, and it led me down various paths that, that might not have done otherwise. And, and in your lecture yesterday, you, you, in the introduction, you said that, so when you realized you couldn't do a PhD at Berkeley, you took a year to go to the library. Talk, talk a little about that, because yeah. in other words, you had to master the field, yeah. uh, that is, the information side. So when I came to Berkeley, the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to sign up. I said, these are all the neuroscience classes I want to take. And my first disappointment is they said, you can't take them. You have to take this biochemistry class. And you have to take this. I said, I couldn't craft my own curriculum. So I said, all right, I'll do those things. And then I took Jeffrey Weiner's uh, anatomy class, which was like, great, this is the best thing in the world. And I just immersed myself in it. But when I found that I couldn't really do what I wanted to do, um, I said, OK, well, I, I, I've quit my job. I'm here. What do I do? I said, let me make my own education. And so uh, I spent a year, uh, about 12 months, uh, Coming, I had a student pass, but I wasn't taking any classes. I had very little interaction with anyone at the university. But I'd go to the libraries here once a week with a list of papers I want to read. I would look up those papers, because there was no internet, right? It's, it's all paper in some library someplace. I'd look at the journal, and I'd say, OK, that's a good one, or that's not a good one. And then I'd photocopy a whole bunch of these. And I had a card, and I'd, I'd come up with a stack of papers, literally a stack of papers several inches thick every week. I'd go home, and I'd read them. And some of them are very, very hard to read. I mean, some papers are very obtuse, and, and the language isn't simple. And, and, and so you, I did this over and over again, again every week. And then I would mark um, which references I wanted to follow up on. Uh, and then I'd go back to the, the library, and I would go through those again. I would spend the day reading here, basically. Uh, and then I would go home again. I lived about an hour away. So um, and I did this for about a year, and I, I just built my own view of what the, the world of neuroscience is. I also read linguistics and some philosophy and some psycho, psychology, where anyone who I thought might have tangential relationship to the, how the brain works. And I made my own view on all these different fields. Uh, which ones are speaking to me as like, yeah, these are on the right track, and these are not on the right track. And, and um, I think that was a luxury that most young people don't have an option to do. You, you just, they, don't, they, get, they get down a track, and they're in some lab, and they learn the language of that lab. But to be able to do this sort of self-directed um, um, study was, and there's a huge amount of neuroscience research, so it was, uh, that was a really unusual thing. So in a way, opting out or being forced to opt out of graduate school was a blessing. Well, it didn't look at it at the time, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Um, I mean, in hindsight, you could say that. I was kind of hoping I would be able to do that as a student, as a graduate student, right? That this is, I'd be encouraged to do this. I would be, you know, someone saying, here's some suggestions. Um, but in the end, it was what I needed to do, and, and um, it was a great thing to do. Uh, I, I mean, I, I just read it voraciously in this field. Uh, so you, you leave graduate school. You've already mentioned you went out and uh, developed some products. And, and I want to 
uh, as we're understanding the different hats you've worn, you, you, you had a sense of the importance of mobile devices and what they could mean for business and the world if, if, if people in the field could actually gather this data and it could be mastered. Well, I did have, in about 1991, uh, I sort of have a, had an epiphany about mobile devices. Now, I had worked for a company called Grid Systems, and we had built mobile computers. They invented the laptop. But I had this uh, sort of epiphany about the future of pocket-sized computers, uh, mobile devices. And I said, oh, my goodness, in the future, everyone's primary computer is going to be in their pocket. And, um, and this is a way we can bring the benefits of computers to billions of people, because in that time, it was very, very expensive and difficult to maintain these things. They took lots of power, and they were complex machines. And I said, no, it's going to be simple. They're going to be in your pocket. They're going to be inexpensive, and billions of people around the world can have them. Now, this sounded crazy at the time, because back then, there was no internet, no web browsers. There was no wireless data networks. No one was using a cellular phone in the United States, at least. Um, there was there was no technology for doing this. There's no battery. The memory technology didn't exist. None of this existed, and 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 people said, "What are you going to do with this mobile device?" I, I couldn't even answer that question. I said, "I just know it's going to happen. I could see this. It's a, a, inevitable in Moore's law. People are going to access information in these things in their pocket." And so it sounded kind of crazy. And I used to talk about this in my VP marketing. He said, "Jeff, stop talking about that. It sounds stupid," uh, but, but I believed it. And I said, it's going to happen. And I said, this is a good thing. I, and this is a, a good thing to go after. This is a good thing to do. I thought it was going to be really good for the world. And I said, OK, that's a thing to work on for a few years. Um, and let's see if we can make progress on that. Um, and we succeeded. I think we succeeded where a lot of other companies failed. There were a lot of failures in this space. Um, we succeeded, because I believe, because I had that long-term vision. I, I, it wasn't like I was building this or that. I was like, no, we're bringing computers to billions of people, and this is the attributes it has to have. Therefore, this is going to happen. So regardless of our failures, we can continue working on this, because it's going to happen. And, uh, and we, we were lucky. We actually did succeed in a big way, actually. So it's funny. As I listen to you, 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 you combine academic skills without being an academic. And then with a, a, a very interesting uh, set of people skills uh, and a kind of a, a sonar mechanism for understanding what's going on in the world and changing it. Is that, is uh, that it's, fair? It's, I guess in hindsight you could say it's like, oh, yeah, I think yeah. it's fair. Um, I, I didn't view it that way. It was viewing it like, I want to do something. This is important. What do I got to do? So, so you, you founded this institute, uh, and ultimately you, you gave the institute to Berkeley. But, but what were the difficulties of founding an institute in a field that was not yet recognized? Well, it was interesting. The idea for starting the institute was not mine. Um, I had a bunch of neuroscience friends, and um, they were sympathetic with my goals of understanding neocortical theory. They understood the difficulties, why this is hard to do, why you can't get funded for this. And, and th several of them suggested, you know, the way to do this is to create an institute. And I said, oh, yeah, like, sure. That, that, that's going to be easy. That sounds like impossible, right? It wasn't, it wasn't impossible from a funding point of view because I could actually fund it myself. I was uh, lucky to be wealthy at that time uh, for my, my work. Um, but it was more like, how do I structure this? Who, what can, associated, how do I get respect for this? Um, who's going to want to work there? And so on. And so I said to a bunch of neuroscientists, I said, look, I will do this if you help me. If you will bring people and ideas um, and, and help me get through these problems. And uh, uh, one of the people I talked to was uh, Bob Knight at Berkeley, who was the head of the Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute at the time. And he said, OK, I'll help you. And a few other people did the same. So I said, OK, we'll get going. Um, the problems were, oh, there was, first of all, there's all these logistical things, which is like starting a business. You've got to have a location. You've got to have a corporate structure. You've got to have boards, advisory boards, you know, legal documents, and pay salaries. And these things would take a lot of time. Uh, and then there's like, what, how are you going to structure the science? And, and who's going to work there? Under what terms? Um, so, I, you know, it got, goes in fits and starts. But after we got going, it turned out that the Redwood uh, Neuroscience Institute became the hot place to be. People started hearing about it around the world, and we, what we did, the best thing we did is we had, every week we brought in outside speakers. We, we'd fly people and we'd say, who do we want to hear from? We want to study the basal ganglia. Who's the best basal ganglia person? Who's going to tell us? And we'd say, Let's, we want to hear from this person. We'd, we'd, sometimes we'd fly them in, we'd pay their way. He said, you've got to give a talk, and we're going to grill you. 
it was very unusual at the talks at the Red Room Neuroscience Institute because usually uh, scientists are very polite. They don't want to. So they'd come in. We'd have like 20, 25 people in the room, and we would just tear into them, not in a mean way, but in a great way, like, explain this more. We didn't understand this in your paper. And people over and over said, my God, you really care about what I'm doing. You've read my papers, <laughs> you know? And, and word spread, <laughs> word spread that getting an invitation to the Redmond Neuroscience Institute was something to be had. Um, and so over the course of the three years I ran it, we had over 100 visitors, like about 120, I think it was. Um, and uh, it became a sort of like a sort of a, a cool little hot spot in the neuroscience world for people who cared about this. And, and interestingly, it, obviously it was your money, the, the fact that you put in place an institution, but, but really it was the mission statement that was really important here. We're going to look at what you're saying, but not, you know, sort of tied to the detail. How can what you're saying impact the big picture? Yeah. Is that, is that yeah, fair? Yeah, it is fair. We, we, what we did is everyone knew the mission of the Institute. It is neocortical theory. I also tell them right up front, this is not a place to retire. This is a place to work on that problem. And I'm not guaranteeing your job for any amount of time, you know, because I knew I didn't want to run an institute for the rest of my life. So as long as we're making progress on this problem, you know, you're welcome to be here. And uh, I said, you can do anything you want, but here's the thing. You have to attend every lecture from an outside speaker. You have to attend journal club, and you have to participate in these things. It's not optional to do those things. Um, and, and, you know, and I'm going to, you know, we're going to, everyone collectively is going to say, is your work contributing to that broader mission? Um, but other than that, you can do whatever you want. You can publish or not publish. You can travel. You know, you can do whatever you want. Um, so that's how I set it up. And um, it was an unusual structure uh, for a research institute. Um, and some of it worked and some of it didn't work, but um, some parts were very successful. Now, your, your mission statement involved a focus on the neocortex. I explain to our audience why that focus, why is the neocortex so important, and what is it? Okay, the, if uh, mammals have a neocortex, all mammals, and non-mammals don't. So, And in, um, in humans and other animals of high intelligence, it's very big. So in the human brain, it's about 60% of the volume of your brain. If you look at a brain, it's the big wrinkly thing that covers everything else. It's like a big sheet of cells that wraps around the rest of the brain, which is actually pretty small. And why it's so important is because it is the, the locus of intelligence. All, high, all language, spoken, written, mathematics, physics, music, whatever, it's all, in the, all a product of the neocortex both production of it and understanding it, all high-level vision, all high-level motor planning. The rest of the brain is very, very important to being a human. It does a lot of stuff. But when we think about, you know, when we're talking about discovering the properties of the world or communicating through language or, you know, the conversation you and I are having right now, it's the neocortex. And so, uh, you know, my goal was, uh, A, that was the most interesting part of the brain to, to, to focus on if you want to understand what intelligence is. And um, also, it turns out that it is, in some ways, one of the most regular parts of the brain. That is, even though it's very, very large, it's, it's much more, uh, it's, like a, it's not homogenous, but it, it, is, um, it is a repeated structure over and over and over again. Where the other parts of the brain are, have been around for much longer time in evolutionary time, and they're highly evolved. So you've got highly evolved things for emotions and highly evolved things for auditory location and so on. But the neocortex appeared big recently. It's just like, boom. And so it had this regular structure. So the idea is like you could figure out principles of how the neocortex works, which apply to all high-level thought processes. I don't need to have a theory of vision and a theory of language and a theory of, of uh, you know, how the brain does physics. It's really all the same thing. This is a miraculous discovery. It's not mine. It's a miraculous discovery. And I said, wow, great. We have a, uh, this is the center. And it's a possibility of finding out a few key principles. And when you figure out those principles, you can explain a lot. And, and so how did you go about uh, discovering those principles or finding who had talked about those principles? It's not as if you found them new. No, um, well, s it, there's clues everywhere. Um, first of all, very, very few people have that focus. They, they're not even looking for those things. Mm -hmm. And so the clues are embedded in all these different disciplines about when people write a little bit about this and a little bit about that. And a large part of the problem that I faced was what to ignore. The field of neuroscience has so much data on so many things and so many different ideas. It's unbelievable how much has been published in this field. You don't, can't get a sense of it until you try to do a, a research, broad research uh, literature study. 
So a lot of it was like sorting through the noise and figuring out where are the gems here? Where are the, the key ideas? And then, then you take those key ideas, and that's a, that's a, uh, a, a hit and miss process. Perhaps it involves some skill. It certainly involves an opinion about how to go about that. And my opinion is different than other people's opinion, but I trusted my instincts on this. And then, um, and then I say, okay, now we have these core pieces that I'm going to ignore all these other things for now. How do I assemble those into a, a theoretical framework? Some of it's out there, kind of hidden. Some of it I had to come up with myself. And, and the, the, the purpose of a theory going back to Kuhn, a paradigm, is to, in a way, give us a simple statement that uh, tells us which data is important and, and lays out a model or a paradigm. Yes, yes. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do in my life's work. Um, you know, in my talk yesterday, I talked about that. I said, what is the framework? What are the, and I listed out principles. I said, these are some of the key principles, I believe. Um, and, um, and, and here's the language I use to describe them, because that's another problem, uh, because everybody has different language for the same similar ideas. So, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do, and, and, and it's, it, I, I view it that way. And I, and I often begin my talks with that quote from Francis Quick about, you know, where he talks about we're, we're missing a framework, which is essentially the same as principles. We're missing a framework for understanding these ideas. And I, I constantly ask myself, how are we doing on that? I think we're making a lot of progress. I, I'm, I'm very pleased with it. I'm, I'm, you know, from where I started, I'm like thrilled, actually. And, and give us a, a rundown of some of the core principles you've come upon. We don't have visuals. Yes. So, and, and our audience is a public audience, uh, and it may be students who would be interested. So simply stated, yeah. what, what, what are the, the let core me, Let me go down a few of them, starting yeah. some very basic ones. Yeah. Uh, one thing that a lot of people are confused about is the brain is not like a computer. The brain is a memory system. It's about storing patterns from the world, not computing. You don't, you don't compute how to move your arm to catch a ball. You actually recall sequences of patterns that have been stored previously, in sort of, and you're recalling them in sort of novel ways. It's all about memory. It's a memory organ. Um, and it has to be trained. It has to be trained from sensory data. You don't, no one goes in and drops the memory in there. It's like you, you have these senses on the world and you have to, and our problem is to figure out how from the sensory stream coming into the, into the neocortex, how it builds a model of the world. The second really big insight, uh, which was first understood, um, well, a couple people involved in this, Mountcastle, uh, Fellman and Vanessen and others, um, essentially, the, it, the neocortex has uh, its most basic structure is it's a hierarchy of memory regions. And so it, even though it looks like a sheet of cells, actually these sheets are connected together in, in the different regions so you can logically think of them as a hierarchy. And that's a real thing. That's not a debatable thing. It's a physical fact. And so now we have, oh, it's a different type of memory system. It's a hierarchical memory. We don't really have hierarchical memory systems in computers or elsewhere. That's a new idea. And I'll, and I'll tell you two more ideas. The next one is that each of those regions in the hierarchy, no matter what they're doing, vision, language, touch, you know, motor plan, whatever, they're all doing the same principle. This is one of those aha moments. Uh, this came from Mount Castle and a few other people um, around 1979, which is like, oh my goodness, this is one of those beautiful things you discover about nature where you think you have all these different things, but they're really one and the same. Vision is the same as audition, which is the same as somatosensory touching, it is the same thing. And there's huge amounts of evidence for this, and yet some people have tr trouble believing it. They just, I can't believe it's true. It's true. And then the final thing was what's an insight that I have, and, 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 and I'm not saying other people didn't have it, but it was a, a real new thing for me, was that what's going on in these regions, uh, in, in this hierarchy of cortical regions, is that it's the fundamental memory principle, the memory property, is memory of sequences, um, of how things move through time in the world, what follows what, what words I say next. Everything I'm doing here is a playback of sequences. You're recognizing sequences of patterns, audition, touch, and even vision. It's all about time-based patterns. And so how does the brain learn sequences? And I've been spending uh, the last um, seven years on that. We made really good progress on that. And you used the term uh, yesterday in the lecture, spatially distributed representation. Sparse distributed. Sp sparsely. Sparse distributed. Yeah, sorry. Sp sparse sparse distributed representation. Sparsely, yeah. yes. Um, we've known for a long time that when you look at the cells in the brain, the brain is made of a bunch of cells. It's just neurons. Lots of them, but it's just cells. When you look at the brain, a normal healthy brain, you'll find that at any moment in time, very few of those cells are active, and most of them are silent. 
And this has been known, this is empirical evidence, and we have not many people thought too hard about it. Some people have, and they say, well, maybe there's some efficiencies in energy usage and blah, blah, blah. Um, but we, we, we now have a, a deep theoretical understanding, uh, and part of this came from other people, part of it came from myself, um, a deep theoretical understanding of why it's sparse. It's not, it's not just about saving energy or some sort of efficiency. There are, there are fundamental information properties that come out of having a, um, a representation in the brain where you have a few things active and most things inactive, and, and they change over time. Um, so it's a temporarily point. You know, at any point, cell, all the cells become active at some point in time, so it's all these, but it's, it's very sparse. You don't see a lot of the cells active at the same time. And so there's these deep information principles, which I now understand the significance of. Um, and and they, they tell me now that all intelligence, whether it's biological or machine or human-made, or doesn't matter, all intelligence is going to be based on sparse representations. I can be certain of that now. And so this become a little bit of a, um, a, a rallying point for me and some other people um, to talk about that. Uh, two other points that come out in your book and in the lecture. One is that it's a, it's a, it's a hierarchical system but the flows of information go both ways. Yes. Uh, and uh, the upper regions are, are the keeper of uh, the models or the patterns, but those can change as there is input of data. Well, it's, it's not quite like that. It's close. Um, they're all learning patterns in this hierarchy. And what, what, what the way the, the, the system works is, is when I want to take an input stream, the lower, the ones, the parts of the neocortex that are closest to the input are learning patterns of small parts of input space. Uh, they're like in the primary visual area, it's learning sequences of little line movements and so on. And as you go up the hierarchy, it's sort of aggregating these and it builds, it builds representations over, you can think about, as you go up the hierarchy, it's, it's assimilating knowledge from a, a broader and broader part of the input space and over more and more time. So you end up with representations that are uh, representing longer periods of time and, uh, and more stable over variations in the world. So in the, the bottom of the hierarchy, in the visual hierarchy, I'll find little line segments, but at the top, I'll find cells that respond to faces and people and things like this. So it's a, it's, it's a, it, it, they're all doing the same thing. They're all learning sequences, but there's this sort of, uh, of a collapsing or, or a converging of, of, of these things as you go up. And then it unfolds, too. So think about my speech right now. Uh, I'm giving, I'm producing this very high velocity, I mean rapidly changing pattern on the order of milliseconds. My muscles are going little, 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 all over the place. I'm recalling a, a sequence, a pattern that's coming out of my neocortex. My whole brain isn't doing this. There's parts, the parts that are low down in the hierarchy that are playing back these rapid sequences. And then there's parts a little bit higher are playing out like you need to say this word. And then there's you need to say this phrase. Or Jeff, talk about sparse distributed representations. And I, so I can have a high level concept at the higher part of the hierarchy, which then unfolds sequences, unfolding sequences, produces this torrent of, of patterns coming out of my, of my musculature. And, and you also talk about the brain and its placidity. So it can adapt uh, creating new bundles of, of information. Yeah, it's, well, it's a learning system, right? So um, it has to adapt and has to take it, it patterns as you're coming in. It has to constantly say, I'm trying to learn something new all the time. Think about it, the brain doesn't get to store it someplace and decide later if it wants to learn it. It says, it says, it's here now, I gotta learn what's going on in the world. And so um, the word plasticity refers to a couple of things. It refers to the fact that, that it's a learning system and that new connections are being formed all the time. And it also refers in the brain that the brain can slowly rewire itself, not just form new connections, but it can slowly rewire itself over time so that you can form entirely new sort of architectures. Um, and this is very well documented uh, in many types of studies. So we have this system which essentially says, look, I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly trying to discover the patterns in the world. I'm constantly adapting. Um, it's a very fluid process, but it's working on the same principles all the time. And uh, uh, an important point that you make, and again, I'm going through some of the high points here to interest our audience so they'll go read your book and, and follow your research. But, but you're, you're suggesting that in the upper regions, uh, conclusions uh, can be reached with only part of the pattern. Talk, talk a little yeah, about that. That's true. This is, uh, quite a few uh, scientists understand this issue and written about it el more eloquently than I have, actually. Um, but your perception of the world, like uh, if you're watching this video, me and you sitting here having this conversation, um, is actually largely 
um, a product of the, the, of the memory in your brain. It's, it's largely a product of the model you've created of the world. So you have a sensory stream of just coming in, and, and you can't really see that. You, you don't really, you're not able to perceive that, actually. Um, we don't have an ability to actually look at it, but we know what it looks like from scientific studies. And it's, it's a very impoverished sense of the world. Um, where it's like my eyes are darting all over the place, looking at little pieces here and there, but I have a perception of you as being stable. Your whole body is here, but if you actually could see what's coming into my optic nerve, it's like this highly distorted little thing going woo, 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 all over the place. It's, it's amazing that you seem stable in front of me. <laughs> so the reason it is is that uh, throughout childhood and, and our early years of development, we built this model of how the world is, and the sensory data invokes the model. So my perception of you as a, as a whole human um, is largely the factor of my model. I actually am getting little pieces of data about you which confirm my model all the time. Yes, it still looks like a person. He's got two hands and a head and feet and so on. You're sitting in a chair. Um, and so my perception that the, 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 the highest levels of the cortex is saying, yes, you know, there you are. Um, and, um, and, and, and in reality, that what's invoking that model is this sort of like crazy changing pattern and all over the place, which is like invoking the model. And the model's constantly testing itself, saying, okay, well, if it, if it is a human, then um, his tie ought to have a knot, and uh, his glasses ought to have things on his ears. And, and I, I'm not conscious of this. I'm not thinking about it. It's not like it's, but the brain is doing this all the time. And, and the bottom line here is that when you take all this together, this is a, this is a computational system. Is that, is that the way I want to say I try to avoid the use computation because people think it's like a computer. Yeah, I and, see. And in the history, in my talk today, I'll talk about this, the history of people thinking about building intelligent machines or what intelligence is, is one where largely people think of it as a computational problem. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, we'll apply algorithms to this, you know. Uh, but in reality, it's not. It's a memory problem. Now, the memory system is a complex memory system, hierarchy, sparse distributed representations and sequences and so on. It's not simple. It's not like I would just put it down on a piece of tape um, or you know, put it on a disk or something like that. It's a, it's a complex memory system, and the memory system itself has properties that are you could call, if you want to call them computational properties, like the way the memory system works, it has certain rules and so on. But fundamentally, it's a memory system. And, um, and if, you don't, you want, if you try to figure out how brains work or what intelligence is or building intelligent machines by saying, okay, it's a bunch of algorithms, you're going to program these algorithms, you're just not going to succeed. Now, where do the emotions come in? That, that's not the part of the system yeah. that is of the, the yeah. brain complex that you're looking at. Well, exactly. So I said, you know, the neocortex is about, uh, neocortex is about 60% of the volume of the human brain. There's a lot of other important stuff to be a human. Um, and there are several uh, small areas of the brain which, are, which really dictate um, emotions. Uh, one famous one is the amygdala. People might have heard about that. Um, it's a little almond-shaped type of thing. Um, it's not part of the neocortex. It's an old structure. So emotions are, are much older on evolutionary time. You know, uh, animals that don't have a neocortex have emotions. Uh, you know, a, a lizard can be, or an alligator can be angry or fight and flee and want to have sex and things like that. Um, and, and, and there's a relationship between those uh, emotional centers in the neocortex. And uh, while I didn't talk about it yesterday, and it's not in most of our models, it's important if you wanted to make a human. <laughs> um, if you want to just capture the essence of intelligence, I argue you don't need to model that. Um, so, for example, in a human, um, one thing will happen if you have a very emotionally salient event, like something happened to you that was very dangerous and you almost died. Your emotion centers in your brain will say, bing, 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 they'll light up and they'll say, remember this. This is the most important thing. If you ever see this again, you'll never forget this. You know, if you're ever in a situation like that again, you're just going to be fearful. Um, and it, it tells the neocortex, like, never forget this. Make this a permanent memory. The neocortex itself is not evaluating the emotional aspects. It's not saying, I know it's emotionally salient. So that's the little thing like the amygdala. But it's telling the neocortex, you know, you should recognize this scenario and tell me when you see it again. So, you know, if I wanted to build intelligent machines that were very human-like, uh, which I don't. Um, if that's what you wanted to do, then you'd have to build emotional capabilities, plus a lot of other stuff. You'd have to build the whole brain. If you're just trying to build intelligent machines that are useful tools for humanity, um, then you don't have to necessarily model all that, or maybe we'll do it in a slightly different way. Your, your long-term plan was to apply what you learn here, which we've discussed in a, in a, a brief uh, a presentation here, uh, 
What are you trying to do with your new company now? The new company, is, it's, it's kind of a, it's part of the process that, you know, I talked to earlier about, like, okay, I have this big long-term goal, right? You know, figure how the neocortex works and build machines that work like that and promote these theories to create a paradigm for this. And the company is one aspect of that. In the same way, like, I started the Neuroscience Institute, or the same reason I wrote a book. I wrote a book, because not because I wanted to be an author, because I felt it was a tool that would help me towards the end the goal. And... Um, my company, Numanta, is in some sense, for me, it plays another role. It's saying, okay, if we figured out how part of the neocortex works, and I think we have, a, a good portion of it, um, how do I get people excited about this? How do I get them interested in this? Well, I can publish scientific papers. Uh, maybe I can write another book, which I probably will do. Um, but there's a whole other world of people out there I want to get excited about this. Um, these are entrepreneurs and, and scientists, I mean, engineers and computer scientists. So by creating a company, if you can create a, a successful product, that gets a lot of people's attention. It's a, it's a real wake-up call for people. Like, wow, there's someone's making some money doing this over here. It's, <laughs> like, it crashes its sounds. It, that's the way it works. And, um, and they'll say, well, how did they do that? Uh, what were the, you know, how did they make that work? That's pretty cool. You know, what's going on there? And I say, here it is. I explained it. I've written it up. You can read it about it today. You can read a white paper on our website, which explains how all this works. And people will study that, and they'll go, that's pretty cool. I want to understand that. So it's a way of proselytizing, you will, to a different audience. Uh, obviously, a company has to be successful to be, you know, has to make money to be successful. So it has a dual mission is to be a successful company. But the reason I started it was a, as, a, as one more vehicle for promoting concepts or a, a way of thinking about the brain and the, its importance for doing that. And, and the long-term possibilities here are streams of data on weather, demography, all sorts of things that, that could reach, uh, could give, make intelligent uh, decisions about the meaning of the data. Yeah, so if you ask myself, okay, if we're on a path to building truly intelligent machines, what can we do today? Mm -hmm. What's really interesting that I can do today? And so we've, uh, we've identified an opportunity at Nemento, which I think is really exciting. Um, the world is full of data. It's, it's blowing, you might, people hear about this, this term is big data, we're washing data, the number of amount of bytes are being stored every year is bigger than the Library of Congress every, you know, it's crazy. And people don't know what to do with it. Well, think about that, streams of data coming from sensors, or from computers, from cars, from streets, from everything. Um, that's just like the data coming into the brain from some sensors. It's just a monster stream of data. And so what we can do is we can apply brain modeling to these streams of data to model the data in the world and act on it immediately, just like humans do. So in, instead of like storing the data someplace, we stream it into a product we call Grok, which is essentially a cortical model. The model builds, uh, builds a model of the world using a neocortical algorithm. It makes predictions about future events, and we can act on those events. So I'll give you just one example. Um, it turns out that, it, that when we consume electricity, there's a lot going on behind the scenes that most people aren't aware of. Uh, large consumers of electricity can buy their electricity at different rates throughout the day. And it can make, they can do, predict, they can make future contracts. They say, I'll pay this amount for this amount of energy six hours from now and so on. And this is, there's a thing called demand response which is going on everywhere. You're not aware of this. Um, and if I could predict better the energy consumption in buildings, um, I can be more efficient, I can, and I can, it helps everyone, it makes a more efficient marketplace, and we can start doing this on a more rapid basis. Um, so this is, this is one of many areas we're looking at, and what we can do is we can do a better job of this, predicting like, okay, how much, is, how much energy is Berkeley campus going to use uh, at six hours from now, and, what, and how much should they be paying for that, or should they do some things now, like pre-cool some buildings, which will be s cheaper than cooling them and use less energy than cooling them later. Um, when you start automating this, then um, you can do this on a building by building basis, you can do it by a floor by floor basis, you could do it by a room by room basis. This gives you the sense of how technology progresses. So that's one example, but the general idea is with this world of wash of data, how do we take advantage of it? How do we build smarter cars and smarter buildings and smarter power grids? And we can use brain technology to do that. So that's pretty exciting. It's, it's a long way from building like fully brilliant, you know, robots or, um, you know, super intelligent machines, but it's on the path. It is not, it is, it, it's, not a, it's not a digression. It's on a, a continuum towards that path. You're uniquely uh, uh, placed to answer this question, uh, reflecting on your own career, but also the research you've done. So what is creativity? I have a very clear idea of that. Uh, right or wrong, it's a, I have a clear idea of it. 
the first thing you have to dispel is this notion that creativity is something special. Um, you're actually exhibiting it every moment of your waking life. You are never in the exact same situation twice. If I look at the patterns coming on your, on your the nerve fibers from your eyes and your ears and your skin, it never repeats ever in your entire life. You're always, you may think you've been sitting here talking to me the whole time, but you've actually looked at the patterns on your vibes. I'm moving a little bit, the ear changing a little bit. It's constantly changing. And the miraculous thing is we perceive the world as not changing. We see it as something like, oh, I know who you are, even I've never met you before. I can see where you're, and, and you're not, and you're still here. This is actually what we're doing all the time at a very low basis. We're saying, here's a new pattern coming in and I'm making predictions uh, based on my previous model of the world of what you should behave like. Creativity is that process. We tend to think of it at a much higher level. So I'm looking at some patterns coming in from some sensory, you know, astronomical data. And I'm trying to figure out, well, what's going on here? What could explain these shifts in the frequencies I'm looking at and so on? It's a novel pattern. And what we do when we're creative, we make analogies to previous experience. It may, be a very, it may be a very subtle analogy. It may not even be obvious to you, but you say, oh, that's a little bit like a pattern I saw three years ago in this other paper about genetics. And, and you say, well, what they learned in the genetics is that this is typically what's going on. So maybe that process will apply here. And if you look at them, uh, take, the, for example, the, the scientific creativity process, it's very obvious it's what people do. We, 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 form, we form a knowledge about the world, and then we, we go one step further and say, here's a new pattern. I, I don't really understand what's going on in this new pattern. But we, and, and the brain says, well, it's kind of like this one. In my talk yesterday, I talked about the specific mechanisms for this. I think I understand the specific mechanisms for this. So creativity is on a spectrum from the everyday where you're not even aware of it where I'm being created by recognizing, you know, you wouldn't think this, but my brain is being created by saying, oh, you know, there's Harry, I know what he's going to do, and I think he's got these things, and he's, I know what's on your paper, it's probably questions <laughs> uh, on thoughts, even though I can't see it. So I'm being creative all the time, I'm making predictions about things I don't really know, but when we, when we bring it up to the high level of the neurocognitive, these very difficult patterns which extend over a long period of time or in very distant places, then we're doing the same process. Um, now, something like artistic creativity, it's a little harder to understand. Um, but I think it's basically the same idea. You're saying, you know, even an artist will say, well, you know, um, th this is the way they typically represent something in, in the art world. And, but I, you know, I have a, a, another view from this part of my you know, literature I've read, which is, you know, something, and I'm going to combine the two and I'll create something new. One final question. How would you advise students to prepare for the future? Um, I get this question a lot. Actually, I get students asking me this a lot. I get, a, I get probably several emails a week where someone says, you know, um, uh, they'll say, you've inspired me. What can I do to do these things? Um, it's a very difficult question to answer because it's hard to give very specific answers. I can't say, well, go to this university and study here. Um, the answers I generally, you know, the, generally, the general answer to this question, and, it, and for some it's unsatisfactory, but it's the best I can do. And I, studied, I said this earlier. You need to find something you're passionate about, that you really care about, that you, you say, you know, this is really important to me. I don't care what it is. Just you figure that out. And then be persistent. And, and go do whatever you have to do. Because I'll tell you what happened. You're going to run into roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. And success in life is basically, success in life, success in business, and success in science is essentially Overcoming roadblocks, one after another, solving problems, one after another. And the only way to do that is to have this bigger vision, to say, you know, I know why I have to put up with this right now because I'm going over there. And um, this is the way to get there, so it really looks hard right now. That's like the biggest Uber advice I can give. Um, and I think, you know, if you talk to a lot of people who, um, who have some level of success in their life or... Uh, accomplishment, they, they very often say the same thing. They, they'll say, you know, I, I knew what I wanted to do and, and I just had to really be persistent um, to getting there. And that's, that's a good life lesson, I think. Jeff, uh, on that note, uh, thank you very much for coming on our program. It was a fascinating uh, intellectual journey. I think it was a great question. I enjoyed it very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.